part two chapter nine of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a raw youth by fyodor dostoyevsky translated by constance garnet part two chapter nine the day had ended with a catastrophe there remained the night and this is what i remember of that night i believe it was one o'clock when i found myself in the street it was a clear still and frosty night i was almost running and in horrible haste but not towards home why home can there be a home now home is where one lives i shall wake up to-morrow to live but is that possible now life is over it is utterly impossible to live now i thought and as i wandered about the streets not noticing where i was going and indeed i don't know whether i meant to run anywhere in particular i was very hot and i was continually flinging open my heavy raccoon-lined coat no sort of action can have any object for me now was what i felt at that moment and strange to say it seemed to me that everything about me even the air i breathed was from another planet as though i had suddenly found myself in the moon everything the town the passers-by the pavement i was running on all of these were not mine this is the palace square and here is st isaac's floated across my mind but now i have nothing to do with them everything had become suddenly remote it had all suddenly become not mine i have mother and liza but what are mother and liza to me now everything is over everything is over at one blow except one thing that i am a thief for ever how can i prove that i am not a thief is it possible now shall i go to america what should i prove by that versilov will be the first to believe i stole it my idea what idea what is my idea now if i go on for fifty years for a hundred years some one will always turn up to point at me and say he's a thief he began his idea by stealing money at roulette was there resentment in my heart i don't know perhaps there was strange to say i always had perhaps from my earliest childhood one characteristic if i were ill-treated absolutely wronged and insulted to the last degree i always showed at once an irresistible desire to submit passively to the insult and even to accept more than my assailant wanted to inflict upon me as though i would say all right you have humiliated me so i will humiliate myself even more look and enjoy it to Charv beat me and tried to show i was a lackey and not the son of a senator and so i promptly took up the role of a lackey i not only handed him his clothes but of my own accord i snatched up the brush and began brushing off every speck of dust without any request or order from him and ran after him brush in hand in a glow of menial devotion to remove some particle of dirt from his dress coat so much that he would sometimes check me himself and say that's enough arcady that's enough he would come and take off his overcoat and i would brush it fold it carefully and cover it with a check silk handkerchief i knew that my schoolfellows used to laugh at me and despise me for it i knew it perfectly well but that was just what gratified me since they want me to be a lackey well i am a lackey then if i am to be a cad well i will be a cad i could keep up a passive hatred and underground resentment in that way for years well at zertschikoff's i had shouted to the whole room in an absolute frenzy i will inform against you all roulette is forbidden by the police and i swear that in that case too there was something of the same sort i was humiliated searched publicly proclaimed a thief crushed well then i can tell you you have guessed right i am worse than a thief i am an informer recalling it now that is how i explain it at the time i was incapable of analysis i shouted that at the time unintentionally i did not know indeed a second before that i should say it it shouted itself the characteristic was there already in my heart 
there is no doubt that i had begun to be delirious while i was running in the streets but i remember quite well that i knew what i was doing and yet i can confidently assert that a whole cycle of ideas and conclusions were impossible for me at that time i felt in myself even at those moments that some thoughts i was able to think but others i was incapable of in the same way some of my decisions though they were formed with perfect consciousness were utterly devoid of logic what is more i remember very well that at some moments i could recognize fully the absurdity of some conclusion and at the same time with complete consciousness proceed to act upon it yes crime was hovering about me that night and only by chance was not committed i suddenly recalled tatiana pavlovna's saying about versilov he'd better have gone at night to the nikolaevsky railway and have laid his head on the rails they'd have cut it off for him for a moment that idea took possession of all my feelings but i instantly drove it away with a pang at my heart if i lay my head on the rails and die they'll say to-morrow he did it because he stole the money he did it from shame no for nothing in the world and at that instant i remember i experienced a sudden flash of fearful anger to clear my character is impossible floated through my mind to begin a new life is impossible too and so i must submit become a lackey a dog an insect an informer a real informer while i secretly prepare myself and one day suddenly blow it all up into the air annihilate everything and every one guilty and innocent alike so that they will all know that this was the man they had all called a thief and then kill myself i don't remember how i ran into a lane somewhere near konovardyevsky boulevard for about a hundred paces on both sides of this lane there were high stone walls enclosing backyards behind the wall on the left i saw a huge stack of wood a long stack such as one sees in timber yards and more than seven feet higher than the wall i stopped and began pondering in my pocket i had wax matches in a little silver match-box i repeat i realized quite distinctly at the time what i was thinking about and what i meant to do and so i remember it even now but why i meant to do it i don't know i don't know at all i only know that i suddenly felt a great longing to do it to climb over the wall is quite possible i reflected at that moment i caught sight of a gate in the wall not two paces away probably barred up for months together standing on the projection below and taking hold of the top of the gate i could easily climb on to the wall i reflected and no one will notice me there is no one about everything's still and there i can sit on the wall and easily set fire to the wood stack i can do it without getting down for the wood almost touches the wall the frost will make it burn all the better i have only to take hold of a birch log with my hand and indeed there is no need to reach a log at all i can simply strip the bark off with my hand while i sit on the wall set light to it with a match and thrust it into the stack and there will be a blaze and i will jump down and walk away there will be no need to run for it won't be noticed for a long while that was how i reasoned at the time and all at once i made up my mind i felt an extraordinary satisfaction and enjoyment and i climbed up i was very good at climbing gymnastics had been my speciality at school but i had my overboots on and it turned out to be a difficult task i succeeded somehow in catching hold of one very slight projection above and raised myself i lifted my other hand to clutch the top of the wall but at that instant i slipped and went flying backwards i suppose i must have struck the ground with the back of my head and must have lain for two or three minutes unconscious when i came to myself i mechanically wrapped my fur coat about me feeling all at once unbearably cold and scarcely conscious of what i was doing i crept into the corner of the gateway and sat crouching and huddled up in the recess between the gate and the wall my ideas were in confusion and most likely i soon fell into a doze i remember now as it were in a dream that there suddenly sounded in my ears the deep heavy clang of a bell and i began listening to it with pleasure 
two the bell rang steadily and distinctly once every two or three seconds it was not an alarm bell however but a pleasant and melodious chime and i suddenly recognized that it was a familiar chime that it was the bell of st nicolay's the red church opposite two shards the old-fashioned moscow church which i remembered so well built in the reign of czar alexey mihailovich full of tracery and with many domes and columns that easter was only just over and the new-born little green leaves were trembling on the meagre birches in two shards front garden the brilliant evening sun was pouring its slanting rays into our classroom and in my little room on the left where a year before two shard had put me apart that i might not mix with counts and senators children there was sitting a visitor yes i who had no relations and suddenly got a visitor for the first time since i had been at two shards i recognized this visitor as soon as she came in it was mother though i had not seen her once since she had taken me to the village church and the dove had flown across the cupola we were sitting alone together and i watched her strangely many years afterwards i learned that being left by versilov who had suddenly gone abroad she had come on her own account to moscow paying for the journey out of her small means and almost by stealth without the knowledge of the people who had been commissioned to look after her and she had done this solely to see me it was strange too that when she came in and talked to touchard she did not say one word to me of being my mother she sat beside me and i remember i wondered at her talking so little she had a parcel with her and she undid it in it there turned out to be six oranges several gingerbread cakes and two ordinary loaves of french bread i was offended at the sight of the bread and with a constrained air i announced that our food was excellent and that they gave us a whole french loaf for our tea every day never mind darling in my foolishness i thought maybe they don't feed them properly at school don't be vexed my own and antonina vasilievna touchard's wife will be offended my schoolfellows will laugh at me too won't you have them perhaps you'll eat them up please don't and i did not even touch her presence the oranges and gingerbread cakes lay on the little table before me while i sat with my eyes cast down but with a great air of dignity who knows perhaps i had a great desire to let her see that her visit made me feel ashamed to meet my schoolfellows to let her have at least a glimpse that she might understand as though to say see you are disgracing me and you don't understand what you are doing oh by that time i was running after touchard with a brush to flick off every speck of dust i was picturing to myself too what taunts i should have to endure as soon as she was gone from my schoolfellows and perhaps from touchard himself and there was not the least friendly feeling for her in my heart i only looked sideways at her dark-coloured old dress at her rather coarse almost working-class hands at her quite coarse shoes and her terribly thin face there were already furrows on her forehead though antonina vasilievna did say that evening after she had gone your mamma must have been very pretty so we sat and suddenly agafia came in with a cup of coffee on a tray it was just after dinner and at that time touchard always drank a cup of coffee in his drawing-room but mother thanked her and did not take the cup as i learned afterwards she never drank coffee in those days as it brought on palpitations of the heart the fact was that touchard inwardly considered her visit and his permitting me to see her an act of great condescension on his part so that the cup of coffee sent her was comparatively speaking a signal proof of humanity which did the utmost credit to his civilization feelings and european ideas and as though on purpose mother refused it i was summoned to touchard and he told me to take all my lesson books and exercise books to show my mother that she may see what you have succeeded in attaining in my establishment at that point antonina vasilievna pursing up her lips minced out to me in a jeering and insulting way your mamma does not seem to like our coffee 
i collected my exercise books and carried them to my waiting mother passing through the crowd of counts and senators children in the classroom who were staring at mother and me and it actually pleased me to carry out touchard's behests with literal exactitude here are my lessons in french grammar here are my dictation exercises here are the conjugations of the auxiliary verbs avoir and etre here is the geography descriptions of the principal towns of europe and all parts of the world and so on for half an hour or more i went on explaining in a monotonous little voice keeping my eyes sedately cast down i knew that my mother knew nothing of these learned subjects could not perhaps even write but in this too i was pleased with my part but i did not succeed in wearying her she listened all the time without interrupting me with extraordinary and even reverent attention so that at last i got tired of it myself and left off her expression was sad however and there was something pitiful in her face she got up to go at last touchard suddenly walked in and with an air of foolish importance asked her whether she was satisfied with her son's progress mother began muttering incoherent thanks antonina vasilevna came up too mother began begging them both not to abandon the orphan who was as good as an orphan now but to treat him with kindness and with tears in her eyes she bowed to them both each separately and to each with a deep bow exactly as simple people bow down when they ask a favour of the gentry the two chars had not expected this and antonina vasilevna was evidently softened and revised her opinion about the cup of coffee to char he mainly responded with even greater dignity that he made no distinction between the children that here all were his children and he was their father that i was almost on an equal footing with the sons of senators and counts and that she ought to appreciate that and so on and so on mother only bowed down but was much embarrassed at last she turned to me and with tears shining in her eyes said good-bye darling she kissed me that is i allowed myself to be kissed she evidently wanted to go on kissing embracing and hugging me but either she herself felt ashamed before company or felt hurt by something else or guessed that i was ashamed of her for she hurriedly went out bowing once more to the two shards i stood still mais suivez donc votre mère said antonina vasilevna il n'a pas de coeur c'est enfant touchard responded by shrugging his shoulders which meant of course it's not without reason that i treat him as a lackey i obediently followed my mother we went out on to the steps i knew that they were all looking at me out of the window mother turned towards the church and crossed herself three times her lips were trembling the deep bell chimed musically and regularly from the belfry she turned to me and could not restrain herself she laid both hands on my head and began crying over it mother stop i'm ashamed they can see from the window she broke out hurriedly well god god be with you the heavenly angels keep you holy mother saint nicolay my god my god she repeated speaking rapidly and making as many signs of the cross over me as she possibly could my darling my darling stay my darling she hurriedly put her hand in her pocket and drew out a handkerchief a blue checked handkerchief with a tightly fastened knot at the corner and began untying the knot but it would not come untied well never mind take it with the handkerchief it's clean it may be of use perhaps there are four fourpenny bits in it perhaps you'll need the money forgive me darling i have not got any more just now forgive me darling i took the handkerchief i wanted to observe that we were allowed very liberal diet by m touchard and antonina vasilevna and were not in need of anything but i restrained myself and took the handkerchief once more she made the sign of the cross over me once more she whispered a prayer and suddenly suddenly bowed to me exactly as she had done to the two shards upstairs a prolonged low bow i shall never forget it then i shuddered i don't know why what had she meant by that bow was she confessing the wrong she had done me as i fancied once long afterwards i don't know but at the time it made me more ashamed than ever that they were looking out of window and that lambert would most likely begin beating me 
at last she went away the apples and oranges had been devoured by the sons of counts and senators and the four fourpenny bits were promptly taken from me by lambert and spent at the confectioner's on tarts and chocolates of which i was not offered a taste fully six months had passed and it was a wet and windy october i had quite forgotten about mother oh by then hate a blind hatred of everything had crept into my heart and was its sustenance though i still brushed to char as before but i hated him with all my might and every day hated him more and more it was then that in the melancholy dusk of one evening i began rummaging for something in my little box and suddenly in the corner i saw her blue cotton handkerchief it had been lying there ever since i had thrust it away i took it out and even looked at it with some interest the corner of the handkerchief still retained the creases made by the knot and even the round impress of the money was distinctly visible i put the handkerchief in again however and pushed the box back it was the eve of a holiday and the bells were ringing for the all-night service the pupils had all gone to their homes after dinner but this time lambert had stayed for sunday i don't know why he hadn't been fetched though he used still to beat me as before he used to talk to me a great deal and often needed me we talked the whole evening about lepage's pistols which neither of us had seen and circassian swords and how they cut how splendid it would be to establish a band of brigands and finally lambert passed to the familiar obscene subjects which were his favourite topics and though i wondered at myself i remember i liked listening suddenly i felt it unbearable and i told him i had a headache at ten o'clock we went to bed i turned away with my head under the quilt and took the blue handkerchief from under my pillow i had for some reason fetched it from the box an hour before and as soon as our beds were made i put it under the pillow i put it to my face and suddenly began kissing it mother mother i whispered and my whole chest contracted as though in a vice i closed my eyes and saw her face with the quivering lips when she crossed herself facing the church and afterwards made the sign of the cross over me and i said to her i'm ashamed they are looking at us mother darling mother were you really with me once mother darling where are you now my far-away visitor do you remember your poor boy whom you came to see show yourself to me just this once come to me if only in a dream just that i may tell you how i love you may hug you and kiss your blue eyes and tell you that i'm not ashamed of you now and tell you that i loved you even then and that my heart was aching then though i simply sat like a lackey you will never know mother how i loved you then mother where are you now do you hear me mother mother do you remember the dove in the country confound him what's the matter with him lambert grumbled from his bed stop it i'll give it you you won't let me sleep he jumped out of bed at last ran to me and began pulling off the bedclothes but i kept tight hold of the quilt which i had wrapped round my head you are blubbering what are you blubbering about you fool i'll give it you and he thumped me he thumped me hard on my back on my side hurting me more and more and and i suddenly opened my eyes it was bright daylight and the snow on the wall was glistening with hoar-frost i was sitting huddled up almost frozen and almost numb in my fur coat and some one was standing over me waking me up abusing me loudly and kicking me in the ribs with his right foot i raised myself and looked i saw a man wearing a splendid bare lined coat and a sable cap he had black eyes foppish pitch-black whiskers a hooked nose white teeth grinning at me a face white and red like a mask he bent down over me very close and a frosty vapour came from his lips at each breath frozen the drunken fool you'll freeze like a dog get up get up lambert i cried who ever are you dolgaruki who the devil's dolgaruki simply dolgaruki tushar the one you stuck a fork into in the restaurant ha he cried with a slow smile of recollection could he possibly have forgotten me ha so it's you it's you he lifted me up and put me on my legs i could hardly stand could hardly walk he led me supporting me with his arm he looked into my eyes as though considering and recalling and listening to me intently and i babbled on continuously without pause and i was delighted so delighted to be talking and so delighted too that it was lambert 
whether for some reason i looked on him as my salvation or whether i pounced on him at that moment because i took him for some one of another world i don't know i did not consider it then but i pounced on him without considering what i said then i don't remember at all and i doubt whether any of it was coherent i doubt whether i even pronounced a word clearly but he listened very attentively he took the first sledge we came upon and within a few minutes i was sitting in his room in the warmth three every man whoever he may be must certainly preserve a recollection of something which has happened to him upon which he looks or is inclined to look as something fantastic exceptional outside the common order of things almost miraculous whether it be a dream a meeting a divination a presentiment or anything of that kind i am to this day inclined to look upon this meeting with lambert as something almost supernatural judging that is from the circumstances and consequences of that meeting it all happened from one point of view however perfectly naturally he was simply returning from one of his nocturnal pursuits the nature of it will be explained later on half drunk and stopping at the gate for a moment caught sight of me he had only been in petersburg a few days the room in which i found myself was small and furnished in an unsophisticated style a typical example of the ordinary petersburg furnished lodgings of the middling sort lambert himself however was very well and expensively dressed on the floor there lay two trunks only half unpacked a corner of the room was shut off by a screen which concealed the bed alphonsine cried lambert Présent, responded from behind the screen a cracked female voice with a parisian accent and two minutes later mademoiselle alphonsine emerged just out of bed hurriedly dressed in a loose wrapper a queer creature tall and as lean as a rake a brunette with a long waist and a long face with dancing eyes and sunken cheeks who looked terribly the worse for wear make haste he spoke to her in french i translate they must have got a samovar hot water quick red wine and sugar a glass here look sharp he's frozen it's a friend of mine he's been sleeping the night in the snow malheureux she exclaimed with a theatrical air clasping her hands now then he shouted holding up his fingers and speaking exactly as though to a dog she at once desisted and ran to carry out his orders he examined me and felt me over tried my pulse touched my forehead and my temple it's strange he muttered that you did not freeze however you were entirely covered with your fur coat head and all so that you were sitting in a sort of nest of fur a glass of something hot arrived i sipped it greedily and it revived me at once i began babbling again i was half lying on the sofa in a corner and was talking all the time i talked even as i sipped but what i said again i scarcely remember moments and even whole intervals of time i have completely forgotten i repeat whether he understood anything of what i said i don't know but one thing i distinctly gathered afterwards and that was that he succeeded in understanding me sufficiently to deduce that he must not take his meeting with me lightly i will explain later in his proper place how he came to make this calculation i was not only extremely lively but at moments i believe cheerful i remember the sun suddenly flooding the room with light when the blinds were drawn up and the crackling stove which some one was lighting who and how i forget i remember too the tiny black lap-dog which mademoiselle alphonsine held in her arms coquettishly pressing it to her heart this lap-dog attracted me so much that i left off talking and twice stretched out towards it but lambert waved his hand and alphonsine with her lap-dog instantly vanished behind the screen he was very silent himself he sat facing me and bending close down to me listened without moving at times he smiled a broad slow smile showing his teeth and screwing up his eyes as though reflecting intensely and trying to guess something i have a clear recollection only of the fact that when i told him about the document i could not express myself intelligibly and tell the story consecutively and from his face i quite saw that he could not understand me but that he would very much have liked to understand so much so that he even ventured to stop me with a question which was risky as at the slightest interruption i broke off and forgot what i was talking of how long we sat and talked like this i don't know and cannot even imagine he suddenly got up and called to alphonsine he needs rest he may have to have the doctor do everything he asks that is vous comprenez ma fille vous avez l'argent no here 
and he drew out a ten rouble note he began whispering with her vous comprenez vous comprenez he repeated to her holding up his finger menacingly to her and frowning sternly i saw that she was dreadfully afraid of him i'll come back and you had better go to sleep he said smiling to me and took his cap mais vous n'avez pas dormi de tout maurice alphonsine began pathetically taisez vous je dormirai après and he went out sauvez she murmured pathetically pointing after him monsieur monsieur she began declaiming at once taking up an attitude in the middle of the room jamais homme ne fut si cruel si bismarck que cet être qui regarde une femme comme ou salaté de hasard une femme qu'est-ce que ce dans notre époque tu la voilà le dernier mot de l'académie française i stared at her open-eyed i saw everything double i had a vision of two alphonsines i suddenly noticed that she was crying i started and realized that she had been talking to me for a long time and that i must have been asleep or unconscious et là de quoi m'aurait servi de la découvrir plutôt she exclaimed et n'aurais je pas autant cogné à tenir ma honte caché toute ma vie peut-être n'est-il pas honnête à une demoiselle de s'appliquer si librement devant monsieur mais enfin je vous avoue que s'il m'était permis de vouloir quelque chose ou oh, ce serait de lui plonger au oh, que mon couteau mais en détournant les yeux de peur que son regard exécrable ne fît trembler mon bras et ne glaça mon courage il a assassiné ce pape russe monsieur il lui arracha sa barre russe pour la vendre à un artiste en chevaux au pont de maréchaux tout près de la maison de monsieur andrieux au nouveau thé article de paris linge chemise vous savez n'est-ce pas au oh, monsieur quand l'amitié rassemble à table espouse enfant sœur ami quand on vive à, à la graisse enflamme mon cœur je veux le demander monsieur est-il bonheur préférable à celui dont tu jouis mais il rit monsieur se montre exécrable et inconcevable et si ce n'était pas par l'entremise de monsieur andrieux jamais oh jamais je ne serai mais quoi monsieur qu'avez-vous monsieur she rushed up to me i believe i had an attack of shivering perhaps a fainting fit i cannot express what a painful and miserable impression this half-crazy creature made upon me she imagined perhaps that she had been commanded to entertain me at any rate she did not leave my side for one instant she had perhaps at one time or another been on the stage she declaimed in a terrible way pirouetted talked incessantly while i had long been silent all i could understand from her story was that she had been closely connected with la maison de m andreur haute nouveauté article de paris etc and perhaps it was one of the family of la maison de m andreur but she had somehow been torn for ever from m andreur par ce monstre furieux et inconcevable and that was the point of the tragedy she sobbed but i fancied that this was all part of the performance and that she was not really crying at all sometimes i fancied that she would suddenly drop to pieces like a skeleton she articulated her words in a jangling broken voice the word preferable for instance she pronounced preferable and on the syllable a positively bad like a sheep coming to myself on one occasion i found her executing a pirouette in the middle of the room but she was not actually dancing the pirouette had some connection with her story and she was simply impersonating some figure in it suddenly she rushed and opened a little old out-of-tune piano that was in the room and began strumming on it and singing i believe that for ten minutes or more i lost consciousness completely i fell asleep 
but the lap-dog yelped and i waked up again for a moment consciousness returned completely and suddenly flooded my mind with light i jumped up in horror lambert i am at lambert i thought and snatching up my hat i rushed to my fur coat où allez-vous monsieur cried the vigilant alphonsine i want to get out i want to go away let me out don't keep me oui monsieur alphonsine assented vigorously and she rushed to open the door into the corridor herself mais ce n'est pas loin monsieur c'est pas loin du tout ça ne vaut pas la peine de mettre votre chouba c'est ici près monsieur she shouted for the benefit of the whole corridor running out of the room i turned to the right par ici monsieur c'est par ici she shouted at the top of her voice clutching at my coat with her long bony fingers and with the other hand pointing to the left of the corridor where i did not at all want to go i broke away and ran to the outer door opening on to the stairs il s'en va il s'en va alphonsine ran after me shouting in her cracked voice mais il me tuera monsieur il me tuera but i was already on the stairs and though she ran after me downstairs i succeeded in opening the front door dashing out into the street and jumping into the first sledge i met i gave the driver my mother's address Four but the clear consciousness that had flickered up for one moment was soon dimmed i still have a faint recollection of the drive and being taken up to my mother's but there i sank almost at once into complete unconsciousness next day as they told me afterwards and indeed i remember it myself i had a moment of lucidity again i found myself in versilov's room and on his sofa i remember around me the faces of versilov my mother liza i remember particularly versilov speaking to me about zertchikov and about prince sergey and showing me some letter to soothe me they told me afterwards that i kept asking with horror about someone called lambert and kept hearing the barking of some lapdog but the faint light of consciousness was soon quenched again by the evening of the second day i was completely prostrate with brain fever but i will anticipate events and explain what had happened when i had run out in the street from zertschikoff's that evening and when calm had been restored there zertschikoff who had returned to the table proclaimed aloud that a regrettable mistake had been made the missing money four hundred roubles had been found in a pile of other money and the bank account turned out to be quite correct then prince sergey who had remained in the room went up to zertschikoff chikoff and insisted that he should make a public declaration of my innocence and should moreover send me an apology in the form of a letter zertchikoff on his side accepted this suggestion as a very proper one and promised in the presence of all to send me next day a letter of explanation and apology prince sergey gave him versilov's address and versilov did in fact receive next day a letter addressed to me in zertchikoff's hand and more than thirteen hundred roubles belonging to me which i had left on the roulette table and so the affair with zertchikoff ended this joyful news did much to hasten my recovery when i regained consciousness when prince sergey returned from the gambling saloon that night he wrote two letters one to me and the other to his old regiment in which he had behaved so scandalously to cornet stepanov he dispatched both letters next morning after that he wrote a report for the authorities and with that report in his hand he went early in the morning to the officer in command of his regiment and announced to him that he a common criminal who had taken part in the forging of the x railway shares surrendered to justice and asked to be tried therewith he handed him the report in which all this was set out in writing he was arrested here is the letter he wrote to me that night word for word precious arkady makarovitch having tried the lackey's way of escape i have lost the right to comfort my soul a little with the thought that i was able in the end to dare to do what was just and fine i have sinned against my fatherland and against my family and for this i the last of my family am punishing myself i don't know how i could have caught at the bare idea of self-preservation and for a time have dreamed of buying them off with money i should have still remained to all eternity a criminal in my conscience even if those people had given back the notes that compromised me they would never have been induced to let me alone as long as i lived what remained to live with them to be on a level with them all my life that was the fate awaiting me i could not accept it and have at last found in myself strength enough 
or perhaps only despair enough to act as i am acting now i have written a letter to my old regiment to my fellow-officers clearing stepanov's character this is not and cannot be an atonement it is only the last will and testament of a man who will be dead to-morrow that is how one must look at it forgive me for turning away from you in the gambling saloon it was because at the moment i was not sure of you now that i am a dead man i can make this confession from the other world poor liza she knows nothing of this decision let her not curse me but judge of it herself i cannot defend myself and cannot even find the words to explain anything to her i must tell you too arkady makarovitch that when she came to me yesterday morning for the last time i confessed that i had deceived her and owned that i had been to anna andreyevna with the intention of making her an offer i could not seeing her love keep this upon my conscience in face of my last determination and i told her she forgave me she forgave everything but i could not believe her it is not forgiveness in her place i could not forgive remember me a little your unhappy friend the last prince sokolsky i lay unconscious for exactly nine days End of part two, chapter nine. Part three, chapter one of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Ernest. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, Part 3, Chapter 1. Now for something quite different. I kept declaring, something different, something different. Yet I kept on scribbling of nothing but myself. Yet I have announced a thousand times already that I don't want to describe myself at all. And I firmly meant not to do so when I began my story, I quite understand that I am not of the slightest interest to the reader. I am describing, and want to describe, other people, not myself. And if I keep coming in, it's only a lamentable mistake, because I can't avoid it, however much I should like to. What I regret most is that I describe my own adventures with such heat. By doing so, I give ground for supposing that I am still the same as I was. The reader will remember, however, that I have exclaimed more than once, Oh, if one could only change the past and begin all over again. I could not have uttered that exclamation if I were not radically changed and had not become an entirely different man now. That is quite evident. And no one can imagine how sick I am of these apologies and prefaces which I am continually forced to squeeze into the very middle of my narrative. To return... After nine days' unconsciousness, I came to myself, regenerated, but not reformed. My regeneration was a stupid one, however, of course, if the word is taken in the wide sense, and perhaps if it had happened now, it would have been different. The idea, or rather the feeling, that possessed me was, as it had been a thousand times before, the desire to get away altogether. But this time I meant to go away not as in the past, when I had so often considered the project and been incapable of carrying it out. I didn't want to revenge myself on anyone, and I give my word of honor that I did not, though I had been insulted by all of them. I meant to go away, without loathing, without cursing, and never to return. But I wanted to do this by my own effort, and by real effort unassisted by any one of them, or by anyone in the whole world, yet I was almost on the point of being reconciled with everyone. I record this absorbing dream not as a thought, but as an overwhelming sensation. I did not care to formulate it as long as I was in bed. Sick and helpless I lay in Versilov's room, which they had given up to me. I recognized, with a pang, how abjectly helpless I was. What was tossing on the bed was not a man, but a feeble straw. And this evidence was not only through illness, and how degrading I felt it. And so, from the very depth of my being, from all the forces in me, a protest began to rise. And I was choking with a feeling of infinitely exaggerated pride and defiance. 
Indeed, I can't remember any time in my whole life when I was so full of arrogant feeling as I was during the early days of my convalescence. That is, while I was tossing like a weak straw on my bed. But for the time I held my peace, and even made up my mind not to think of anything. I kept peeping at their faces, trying to guess from them all I wanted to know. It was evident that they, too, did not want to ask questions or be inquisitive, but talked of something irrelevant. This pleased me, and at the same time mortified me. I won't attempt to explain the contradiction. I did not see Liza so often as my mother, though she came in to see me every day, and indeed twice a day. From fragments of their talk, and from their whole air, I gathered that Liza had a great deal on her hands, and that she was indeed often absent from home on business of her own. The very fact that she could have business of her own was something like a grievance to me, but all these were morbid, purely physical sensations which are not worth describing. Tatiana Pavlovna came, too, almost daily to see me, and though she was by no means tender with me, she did not abuse me as usual, which annoyed me extremely, so much so that I said to her openly, You know, Tatiana Pavlovna, when you're not scolding, you're very tedious. Well, then, I won't come and see you, she blurted out, and went away. And I was pleased that I had got rid of one of them, at least. Most of all, I worried my mother. I was irritable with her. I developed a terrific appetite, and grumbled very much that the meals were late, and they were never late. Mother did not know how to satisfy me. Once she brought some soup, and began, as usual, feeding me with it herself, and I kept grumbling as I ate it, and suddenly I felt vexed that I was grumbling. She is perhaps the only one I love, and I am tormenting her. But I was none the less ill-humored, and I suddenly began to cry from ill-humor, and she, poor darling, thought I was crying from tenderness, stooped down, and began kissing me. I restrained myself and endured it, but at that instant I positively hated her. But I always loved my mother, and at that very time I loved her and did not hate her at all, but it happened as it always does, that the one you love best you treat worst. The only person I hated in those days was the doctor. He was a young man with a conceited air, who talked abruptly and even rudely, as though all these scientific people had only yesterday discovered something special, when in reality nothing special had happened, but the mediocrity. The man in the street is always like that. I restrained myself for a long time, but at last I suddenly broke out and informed him before everyone that he was hanging about unnecessarily, that I should get better just as well without him, that, though he looked like a scientific man, he was filled with nothing but conventional ideas, and did not even understand that medicine had never cured anyone, that, in fact, he was, in all probability, grossly ill-educated, like all the specialists who had become so high and mighty among us of late years. The doctor was very much offended, showing, by that very fact, that he was that sort of person. However, he still came as before. I told Versilov at last that if the doctor did not give up coming, that I should say something to him ten times as disagreeable. Versilov only observed that it was impossible to say anything even twice as disagreeable as I had said, let alone ten times. I was pleased at his saying that. He was a man, though. I am speaking of Versilov. He, he was the sole cause of it all, and strange to say, he was the only one towards whom I did not feel resentful. It was not only his manner to me that won me over. I imagined that we felt at that time that we owed each other many explanations. And, for that very reason, it would be our best course never to explain. It's extremely pleasant in such situations to have to do with a man of intelligence. I have mentioned already, in the second part of my story, that he told me briefly and clearly of Prince Sergei's letter to me about Zerchtikov, about what he, Prince Sergei, had said to the latter, and so on. As I had made up my mind to keep quiet, I only asked him two or three brief questions. He answered them clearly and exactly, but entirely without superfluous words, and what was best of all, without feeling. I was afraid of superfluous feeling at that time. I said nothing about Lambert, but the reader will readily understand that I thought a great deal about him. In my delirium, 
I spoke more than once about Lambert, but recovering from my delirium and looking about me, I quickly reflected that everything about Lambert remained a secret, and that everyone, even Versilov, knew nothing about him. Then I was relieved, and my fears passed away. But I was mistaken, as I found out later to my astonishment. He had come to the house during my illness, but Versilov said nothing to me about it, and I concluded that Lambert had lost all trace of me forever. Nevertheless, I often thought of him. What is more, I thought of him not only without repulsion, not only with curiosity, but even with sympathy, as though foreseeing from him something new, some means of escape in harmony with my new feelings and plans. In short, I made up my mind to think over Lambert as soon as I should be ready to think over anything. I will note one strange fact. I had entirely forgotten where he lived and in what street it had all happened. The room, Alfonsina the lapdog, the corridor, all I remembered, so that I could have sketched them at once. But where it had all happened, that is, in what street and in what house, I had utterly forgotten. And what is strangest of all, I only realized this three or four days after I had regained complete consciousness, when I had been occupied with the thought of Lambert for a long time. These, then, were my first sensations on my resurrection. I have noted only what was most on the surface, and most probably I was not able to detect what was most important. In reality, perhaps, what was really most important was even then taking shape and becoming defined in my heart. I was not, of course, always vexed and resentful simply at my broth's not being brought me. Oh, I remember how sad I was then and how depressed, especially at moments when I had remained a long while alone. As ill luck would have it, they soon saw that I was dreary with them and that their sympathy irritated me, and they began more and more often to leave me alone, a superfluous delicacy of perception on their part. On the fourth day of consciousness, I was lying in my bed at three o'clock in the afternoon, and there was no one with me. It was a bright day, and I knew that at four o'clock, when the sun would set, its slanting red rays would fall on the corner of my wall and throw a patch of glaring light upon it. I knew that from the days before, and that that would certainly happen in an hour's time, and above all, that I knew of this beforehand, as certainly as twice two make four, exasperated me to fury. I turned round impulsively, and suddenly, in the midst of the profound stillness, I clearly distinguished the words, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. The words were pronounced in a half whisper, and were followed by a deep drawn sigh. And then everything was still again. I raised my head quickly. I had before, that is the previous day, and even the day before that, noticed something special in our three rooms downstairs. In the little room beyond the dining room, where Mother and Liza were accustomed to sleep, there was evidently now someone else. I had more than once heard sounds, both day and by night, but only for brief moments, and complete stillness followed immediately, and lasted for several hours, so that I took no notice of the sounds. The thought had occurred to me the evening before that Versilov was in there, especially as he soon afterwards came in to me, though I knew for a fact from their conversation that during my illness Versilov had been sleeping out in another lodging. I had known for some time past that Mother and Liza had moved into my former coffin upstairs, to make it quieter for me, I imagined, and I had even once wondered how the two of them could have possibly fitted themselves into it. And now it suddenly appeared that there was some person living in their old room, and that that person was not Versilov. With an ease which I had not the least expected, for I had till then imagined I was quite helpless, I dropped my feet over the bed, slipped them into slippers, threw on a gray astrakhan dressing gown which lay close at hand, Versilov had sacrificed it for my benefit, and made my way through the parlor to what had been Mother's bedroom. What I saw there completely astounded me. I had never expected anything of the kind, and I stood still in the doorway, petrified. There was sitting there a very gray-headed old man, with a big and very white beard, and it was clear that he had been sitting there for a long time. He was not sitting on the bed, but on Mother's little bench, resting his back against the bed. 
He held himself so upright, however, that he hardly seemed to need a support for his back, though he was evidently ill. He had over his shirt a short jacket lined with fur. His knees were covered with mother's plaid, and on his feet were slippers. He was, it could be discerned, tall, broad-shouldered, and of a hale appearance, in spite of his invalid state, though he was somewhat thin and looked ill. He had rather a long face, and thick, but not very long hair. He looked about seventy. On a little table, within reach, lay three or four books and a pair of silver-rimmed spectacles. Though I had not the slightest idea of meeting him, I guessed instantly who he was, though I was still unable to imagine how he could have been sitting all those days, almost beside me, so quietly that till that time I had heard nothing of him. He did not stir on seeing me. He looked intently at me in silence, just as I did at him, the only difference being that I stared at him with the greatest astonishment, and he looked at me without the slightest. Scrutinizing me, on the contrary, from head to foot during those five or ten seconds of silence, he suddenly smiled and even laughed a gentle, noiseless laugh. And though the laugh was soon over, traces of its serene gaiety remained upon his face, and above all in his eyes, which were very blue, luminous and large, though they were surrounded by innumerable wrinkles, and the eyelids were swollen and drooping. This laugh of his was what had most effect on me. I consider that in the majority of cases people are revolting to look at when they are laughing. As a rule, something vulgar, something, as it were, degrading, comes to the surface when a man laughs. Though he is almost unconscious of the impression he is making in his mirth, as little, in fact, as anyone knows what he looks like when he is asleep. One person's face will look intelligent asleep, while another man, intelligent in waking life, will look stupid and ridiculous when he is sleeping. I don't know what this is due to. I only mean to say that people laughing, like people asleep, have no idea what they look like. The vast majority of people don't know how to laugh at all. It is not a matter of knowing how, though. It's a gift, and it cannot be cultivated. One can only cultivate it, perhaps, by training oneself to be different, by developing and improving, and by struggling against the evil instincts of one's character, then a man's laugh might very likely change for the better. A man will sometimes give himself away completely by his laugh, and you suddenly know him through and through. Even an unmistakably intelligent laugh will sometimes be repulsive. What is most essential in laughter is sincerity. And where is one to find sincerity? A good laugh must be free from malice, and people are constantly laughing maliciously. A sincere laugh, free from malice, is gaiety. And where does one find gaiety nowadays? People don't know how to be gay. Versilov made this observation about gaiety, and I remember it. A man's gaiety is what most betrays the whole man from head to foot. Sometimes one will be for a long time unable to read a character. But if the man begins to laugh, his whole character will suddenly lie open before you. It is only the loftiest and happiest natures whose gaiety is infectious, that is, good-hearted and irresistible. I am not talking of intellectual development, but of character, of the whole man. And so, if you want to see into a man and to understand his soul, don't concentrate your attention on the way he talks or is silent, on his tears, or the emotion he displays over exalted ideas. You will see through him better when he laughs. If a man has a good laugh, it means that he is a good man. Take note of every shade. A man's laugh must never, for instance, strike you as stupid, however gay and good-humored he may be. If you notice the slightest trace of stupidity in his laughter, you may be sure that that man is of limited intelligence, though he is continually dropping ideas wherever he goes. Even if his laugh is not stupid, but the man himself strikes you as being ever so little ridiculous when he laughs, you may be sure that the man is deficient in personal dignity, to some extent anyway. Or if the laughter, though infectious, strikes you for some reason as vulgar, you may be sure that that man's nature is vulgar, and all the generous and lofty qualities you have observed in him before are either intentionally assumed or unconsciously borrowed, and that the man is certain to deteriorate, to go in for the profitable, and to cast off his noble ideas without regret as the errors and enthusiasm of youth. 
I am intentionally introducing here this long tirade on the subject of laughter, and am sacrificing the continuity of my story for the sake of it, for I consider it one of the most valuable deductions I have drawn from life, and I particularly recommend it to the attention of girls who are ready to accept the man of their choice, but are still hesitating and watching him mistrustfully, unable to make their final decision, and don't let them jeer at a wretched raw youth for obtruding his moral reflections on marriage, a subject which he knows nothing about, but I only understand that laughter is the surest test of the heart. Look at a baby. Some children know how to laugh to perfection. A crying baby is disgusting to me, but a laughing, merry one is a sunbeam from paradise. It is a revelation from the future, when man will become at last as pure and simple-hearted as a child. And, indeed, there was something childlike and incredibly attractive in the momentary laughter of this old man. I went up to him at once. "'Sit down. Sit down a bit. You can scarcely stand on your legs, I dare say,' he urged me, motioning me to a seat beside him, and still gazing into my face with the same luminous gaze. I sat down beside him and said, "'I know you. You are a Makar Ivanovich.' "'Yes, darling. It's very good that you are up. You are young. It is good for you. The old monk looks towards the grave.' but the young must live. But are you ill? Yes, dear, chiefly in my legs. My feet brought me as far as the door, and here I've sat down, and they are swollen. I've had it since last Friday when there were degrees, i.e., when there was a frost. I used to rub them with ointment, you see. The year before last, the doctor, Edmund Karlovich, prescribed it me in Moscow, and the ointment did good. I... It did good, but now it's no use. And my chest, too, is choked up, and since yesterday my spine has been bad, as though dogs were gnawing it. I don't sleep nights. How is it I haven't heard you here at all? I broke in. He looked at me as though considering something. Only don't wake your mother, he added, as though suddenly remembering something. She has been busy close at hand all night, and as quiet as a mouse. And now I know she is lying down. Ach, it's bad for a sick monk, he sighed. The soul hangs by a thread, it seems. Yet it still holds on, and still is glad of the light. And it seems, if all life were to begin over again, the soul would not shrink even from that. Though maybe such a thought is sinful. Well, why sinful? Such a thought is a dream, and the old monk should take leave with blissful resignation. Again, if one goes to meet death with murmur or repining, that is a great sin. But if from the gladness of the spirit one has grown to love life, I fancy God will forgive, even a monk. It's hard for a man to tell of every sin what is sinful and what is not. Therein is mystery passing the mind of man. A monk must be content at all times, and ought to die in the full light of his understanding, in holy peace and blessedness, filled full with days, yearning for his last hour, and rejoicing when he is gathered as the ear of wheat to the sheaf, and has fulfilled his mystery. You keep talking of mystery. What does it mean, having fulfilled his mystery? I asked, and looked round towards the door. I was glad that we were alone, and that all around the stillness was unbroken. The setting sun cast a dazzling light on the window. His talk was rather high-flown and rambling, but very sincere. There was a sort of intense exaltation in it, as though he really were delighted at my coming. But I noticed unmistakable signs that he was feverish, extremely so, in fact. I, too, was ill. I, too, had been in a fever from the moment I went into him. What is the mystery? Everything is a mystery, dear, and all is God's mystery. In every tree, in every blade of grass, that same mystery lies hid. Whether the tiny bird of the air is singing, or the stars in all their multitudes shine at night in heaven, the mystery is one, ever the same. And the greatest mystery of all is what awaiteth the soul of man in the world beyond. So it is, dear. I don't know in what sense you... I am not speaking, of course, to tease you, and I assure you I believe in God, but all these mysteries have long been discovered by human intelligence or, if they have not yet been discovered, they will be, for certain, and probably in a very short time. 
The botanist knows perfectly well how the tree grows. The psychologist and the anatomist know why the bird sings, or soon will know. And as for the stars, they are not only all counted, but all their motions have been calculated with the greatest exactitude, so that they can predict even a thousand years beforehand the very minute of the appearance of some comet, and now even the composition of the most remote star is known. You take a microscope. That is a sort of magnifying glass that magnifies a thousand times. And look through it at a drop of water, and you will see in it a whole new world. A whole world of living creatures. Yet this, too, was once a mystery, but it has been revealed by science. I've heard about that, darling. I have heard folk tell of it more than once. To be sure, it's a great and glorious thing. All has been vouchsafed to man by God's will. Not for naught did the Lord breathe into him the breath of life, live, and learn. That's a commonplace. You're not antagonistic to science, though. Not a clerical. Though I don't know whether you'll understand. No, darling, I did not study science in my youth, and though I am not learned, I do not repine at that. If it's not for me, it will be for another. Maybe better so, for every man has his allotted part. For science, dear, is not of use for all. All men are unbridled, each wants to astonish all the world, and I should have perhaps more than all if I had been learned. But now, being very unlearned, how can I be puffed up when I know nothing? You, now, are young and clever. You must study, such is the lot ordained you. Understand all things, that when you meet an infidel or an evildoer, you may be able to answer him, and he may not lead you astray with his frantic words, or confound your unripe thoughts. That glass I saw not so long ago. He took a breath and heaved a sigh. There was no doubt that my coming in was a source of great satisfaction to him. His desire to be communicative was almost morbid. What is more, I am certainly not mistaken in declaring that at moments he looked at me with extraordinary affection. He laid his hand on mine caressingly, stroked me on the shoulder, though there were minutes when I must confess he seemed to forget all about me, as though he had been sitting alone. And though he went on talking warmly, it seemed at times as though he were talking to the air. In the Genadiev desert, dear, there lives a man of great understanding. He is of noble birth, and by rank a major, and he has great possessions. When he lived in the world, he would not be bound by marriage. He has been withdrawn from the world for nearly ten years, loving still and silent resting places, and keeping his heart free from worldly vanities. He follows all the monastic rules, but will not become a monk, and he has so many books, dear, as I have never seen in any other man's possession. He told me himself that his books were worth eight thousand rubles. His name is Pyotr Valerianich. He has taught me a great deal at different times, and I loved listening to him exceedingly. I said to him once, How is it, sir, that with your great understanding, after living here ten years in monastic obedience and in complete renunciation of your will, how is it you don't take honorable vows, so as to be still more perfect? And he said to me thereupon, You talk of my understanding, old man. Perhaps my understanding has held me in bondage, and I have not kept it in submission. And you speak of my obedience. Maybe I have long since lost the right measure for myself. And you talk of the renunciation of my will. I am ready to be deprived of my money on the spot, and to give up my rank, and to lay all my medals and ribbons on the table, but my pipe of tobacco, though I've been struggling for ten years, I can't do without. What sort of monk should I be, and how could you glorify the renunciation of my will? And I marveled then at this humility. Well, last year, about St. Peter's Day, I went again to that desert. The Lord led me there. And I saw standing in his cell that very thing, a microscope. He had ordered it for a great sum of money from abroad. Stay, said he. Old man, I'll show you a marvelous thing you have never hitherto looked upon. You see a drop of water as pure as a tear. Well, look what is in it, and you will see that the mechanisms will soon seek out all the mysteries of God and not leave one for either you or me. That is what he said, I remember. But I had looked through such a microscope thirty-five years before that at Alexander Valdemirovich Malagazov's, who was our old master, Andrei Petrovich's maternal uncle. It was from him the property came on his death to Andrei Petrovich. He was a grand gentleman, a great general, and he used to keep a pack of hounds, 
and I lived many years with him as huntsman. So he, too, set up this microscope. He brought it with him, and he told all the servants to come up one after another, male and female, and look through. He showed them a flea, and a louse, and the end of a needle, and a hair, and a drop of water. And it was diverting. They were afraid to go up, and afraid of the master. He was hasty. Some did not know how to look properly, and the elder saw nothing. Others were frightened and cried out. The elder, Savin Makarov, covered his eyes with both hands and cried, Do what you will with me, I won't go near. There was much foolish laughter. I didn't confess to Pyotr Valerianich, though, that I had seen this marvel before more than thirty-five years ago, because I saw it was a great pleasure to him showing it. I began, on the contrary, admiring it and marveling. He waited a bit and asked, Well, old man, what do you say now? And I lifted myself up and said to him, The Lord said, Let there be light, and there was light. And thereupon he said to me all at once, And was there not darkness? And he said that so strangely he did not even laugh. I wondered at him then, and he seemed to be angered, and said no more. The fact of the matter is, your Pyotr Valerianich is eating rice and raisins in the monastery, and bowing to the ground, while he does not believe in God, and you hit on the wrong moment, that's all, I said. And what's more, he is rather an absurd person. I suppose he must have seen that microscope a dozen times before. Why should he go off his head when he saw it for the thirteenth? What nervous susceptibility! He must have got that from living in a monastery. He was a man of pure life and lofty mind, the old man pronounced impressively, and he was not an infidel. There was a cloud over his mind, and his heart was not at peace. Very many such men have come nowadays from the ranks of the gentry and learned. And something more I will tell you. A man punishes himself. But you watch them and do not worry them, and before you lie down to sleep at night, remember them in your prayers. For such are seeking God. Do you pray at night? No, I regard it as an empty ceremony. I must own, though, that I like your Pyotr Valerianich. He's not a man of straw, anyway, but a real person, rather like a man very near and well known to both of us. The old man only paid attention to the first part of my answer. You're wrong, my dear, not to pray. It is a good thing. It cheers the heart before sleep, and rising up from sleep and awakening in the night. Let me tell you this. In the summer in July, we were hastening to the monastery of Our Lady for the Holy Festival. The nearer we got to the place, the greater the crowd of people, and at last there were almost two hundred of us gathered together, all hastening to kiss the holy and miraculous relics of the two great saints, Anarchy and Grigori. We spent the night, brother, in the open country, and I waked up early in the morning, when all was still, sleeping, and the dear sun had not yet peeped out from behind the forest. I lifted up my head, dear, I gazed about me and sighed, everywhere beauty passing all utterance. All was still, the air was light, the grass grows. Grow, grass of God. The bird sings, sing, bird of God. The babe cries in the woman's arms, God be with you, little man. Grow and be happy, little babe. And it seemed that only then, for the first time in my life, I took it all in. I lay down again. I slept so sweetly. Life is sweet, dear. If I were better, I should like to go out again in the spring. And that it's a mystery makes it only the better. It fills the heart with awe and wonder, and that awe maketh glad the heart. All is in thee, my lord, and I, too, am in thee. Have me in thy keeping. Do not repine, young man. It is even more beautiful because it is a mystery, he added fervently. It's the more beautiful for being a mystery. I will remember those words. You express yourself very inaccurately, but I understand you. It strikes me that you understand and know a great deal more than you can express. Only you seem to be in delirium, I added abruptly, looking at his feverish eyes and pale face. But he did not seem to hear my words. Do you know, dear young man, he began again, as though going on with what he had been saying before, do you know there is a limit to the memory of a man on this earth? The memory of a man is limited to a hundred years. For a hundred years after his death, his children, or his grandchildren who have seen his face, can still remember him. But after that, though his memory may still remain, it is only by hearsay, in thought, for all who have seen his living face have gone before. And his grave in the churchyard is overgrown with grass. 
the stones upon it crumble away, and all men, and even his children's children, forget him. Afterwards they forget even his name, for only a few are kept in the memory of men, and so be it. You may forget me, dear ones, but I love you from the tomb. I hear, my children, your gay voices. I hear your steps on the graves of your kin. Live for a while in the sunshine. Rejoice, and I will pray to God for you. I will come to you in your dreams. It is all the same. Even in death is love. I was myself in the same feverish state as he was. Instead of going away or persuading him to be quiet, or perhaps putting him to bed, for he seemed quite delirious, I suddenly seized his arm, and bending down to him and squeezing his hand, I said in an excited whisper, with inward tears, I'm glad of you. I have been waiting a long time for you, perhaps. I don't like any of them. There is no seemliness in them. I won't follow them. I don't know where I'm going. I'll go with you. But luckily, Mother suddenly came in, or I don't know how it would have ended. She came in, only just awake, and looking agitated, in her hand she had a tablespoon and a glass. Seeing us, she exclaimed, I knew it would be so. I'm late with his quinine, and he's all in a fever. I overslept myself, Makar Ivanovich, darling. I got up and went out. She gave him his quinine and put him to bed. I, too, lay down on mine in a state of great excitement. I tossed about, pondering on this meeting, with intense interest and curiosity. What I expected from it I don't know. Of course, my reasoning was disconnected, and not thoughts, but fragments of thoughts flitted through my brain. I lay with my face to the wall, and suddenly I saw in the corner the patch of glowing light which I had been looking forward to with such curses, and now I remember my whole soul seemed to be leaping for joy, and a new light seemed penetrating to my heart. I remember that sweet moment, and I do not want to forget it. It was only an instant of new hope and new strength. I was convalescent then, and therefore such transports may have been the inevitable result of the state of my nerves. But I have faith, even now, in that bright hope. That is what I wanted to record and to recall. Of course, even then I knew quite well that I should not go on a pilgrimage with Makar Ivanovich, and that I did not know the nature of the new impulse that had taken hold of me. But I had pronounced one word, though in delirium, there is no seemliness in their lives. Of course, I thought in a frenzy, from this minute I am seeking seemliness, and they have none of it, and that is why I am leaving them. There was a rustle behind me. I turned round. Mother stood there, bending down to me and looking with timid inquiry into my face. I took her hand. Why did you tell me nothing about our dear guest, Mother? I asked suddenly, not knowing I was going to say it. All the uneasiness vanished from her face at once, and there was a flush, as it were, of joy. But she made me no reply except the words, Liza, don't forget Liza either. You've forgotten Liza. She said this in a hurried murmur, flushing crimson, and would have made haste to get away, for above all things she hated displaying her feelings, and in that she was like me, that is, reverent and delicate. Of course, too, she would not care to begin on the subject of Makar Ivanovich with me. What could we say to each other with our eyes was quite enough. But though I hated demonstrativeness, I still kept her by her hand. I looked tenderly into her eyes and laughed softly and tenderly, and with my other hand stroked her dear face, her hollow cheeks. She bent down and pressed her forehead to mine. Well, Christ be with you, she said suddenly, standing up, beaming all over. Get well. I shall count on your doing so. He is ill, very ill. Life is in God's hands. Ah. What have I said? Oh, that could not be. She went away. All her life, in fear and trembling and reverence, she had honored her legal husband, the monk, Makar Ivanovich, who, with large-hearted generosity, had forgiven her once and forever. End of Part 3 Chapter 1